Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you uh, with us today at Liberty University School of Business. Uh, today we had the business convocation with Mr. James Golden, and uh, I just want to give a, a, a brief overview of uh, James's background. He's the executive producer of the Rush Limbaugh show, goes by the pseudonym Bo Snurdly, but that show reaches 10 to 20 million people. Kind of interesting to think that I'm sitting with the producer of the biggest media show in history, period. I, that kind of came on me. I started doing my research, and uh, that's uh, pretty powerful stuff. And so the radio stations he's affiliated with hit 250 million people, and uh, he works every day on content. He's been working side by side with Rush for 30 years on uh, the daily news that affects all of our lives. And so as an educator, I like to be with people who are smarter than me. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Well, James I don't know Golden. Where, I don't know where to go with that. Smarter than you, no way. Oh, yeah. No way, professor and congressman. And secondly, you know, when I hear you, I get a little bit embarrassed because let me just set the record really, really straight. Rush Limbaugh does not need a producer. Yeah. Doesn't need so when he's right. away, yep. maybe yeah, produce the show. When yep. Rush is there, right. Rush is the show. Yep. He is mo the most incredible broadcaster of this and last century. He spanned. Yep. Now, um, when Rush first started, let me just, since, since <laughs> we're going to go there, let's point. go there for a minute. <laughs> when Rush first started, yep. th uh, he was on 56 radio stations. Within a few years, that grew to over 600 radio stations. When Rush first started, there were approximately 1,200 radio stations hmm. in the country that were doing a talk radio format. Mm -hmm. After Rush picked up his steam and got going, the rest has been history. There are over 12,000 <laughs> now across the country yep. that are doing the talk format. I was in New York recently. I ran into a friend of mine who was a, a high-powered executive over mm. at Fox News, and one of the things that he said to me, and I won't call him names, he said, yeah. if it wasn't for Rush, yep. there would be no Fox News. Yeah. And that is absolutely 100% true. Some. But then you look at what are the other uh, impacts that the show has had, that Rush has had. Um, you can look at the number of sponsors that have come through who had startup businesses, mm. Whose, whose businesses are now nationwide, yep. and they've hired people nationwide. You look at the political impact for sure, and although a lot of people want to stress the politics, that's not all he does. Right. Yep. He does the cultural, he does, and he does whatever comes to mind that's funny for him. Yeah. Now, the thing that most people also don't get is what a great broadcaster he is. So, and I've seen that, and I've had, and, and thank God, I've been blessed to sit across and watch this incredible broadcaster work. Rush has cochlear implants. Mm -hmm. He's deaf. Now, most people don't even realize that because of the way that he's still able to do his program. Yeah. But even when he was completely without hearing, before the cochlear implants were put in, he didn't miss a beat. Yep. His timing, simply impeccable. This man is a, a one-man phenomenon. <laughs> you know, great. and so he, he'll joke, he jokes, or maybe he's not joking, and calls us his underrated staff, his overrated staff. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, but we are all, and, and we've had the same staff around almost for the entire duration. Yep. Okay? And that's unusual in the broadcast business. Yep. Most people just come and go, come and go, come and right. go and staff. But he's held a staff, and why has he done that? Because everyone that works for him loves working for him. Yep. Because he's just incredible. I think when, you know, people want to focus on the politics, and, and okay, you can focus on the politics. And he thankfully has changed the course of American politics. People want to just talk about the media mm -hmm. and what he's done with the media. That doesn't get enough attention in Russia's case because yep. of his profound impact on the media. Yep. But then there's something else that doesn't get impact, and that's what kind of man he is. Yeah. And I will tell you, you know, it's amazing to me the number of times you can look at someone's media caricature, and if you're lucky enough to, to know the person, you see how totally off from the media character mm -hmm. that you were seeing that yeah. human being is. Right. In Russia's case, I will tell you, <clears throat> he's one of the kindest, respectful, mm. 
generous, big-hearted, yep. intelligent, and profound human beings I've ever met. Yep. And it's just been, I've been blessed to just be a member of the staff. Oh, I love hearing it from you, and I agree with it. And he's a genius, and that's why he picked you to be his right-hand mm. man. He picked you because you had that Methodist <clears throat> upbringing. See, but I'm not a, <clears throat> a right-hand, no, because I'm good at radio. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I would say right-hand man, <laughs> look, we've got a lot of people on the staff. Not a lot, I mean, it's yeah. not a huge staff, but we've got the people that handle our web site we've got people that handle the audio sound bites and they're just as vital to the show right design we have the people that <clears throat> do the engineering we have people that the limbaugh letter is the most successful political newsletter huh. in this country and has been now How many for over 25 years i don't know the exact circulation yeah all i do know it's at the top yeah Good. okay Unreal. and I, I don't want to give a, a false number but it <laughs> right. was it is the number one political newsletter That's and great. then you look at russia's website which is extremely successful and by the way he didn't start doing the website until he saw a great businessman how it was going to be profitable. You had a lot of other people that were doing right. and investing yep. a lot in websites and weren't making any money. And yep. Rush held off people. Why aren't you on the internet? Because he held off until he could really identify and see the business hmm. model. That's great. That's what I'm saying. He's an incredible businessman yep. along with being an incredible broadcaster. Yep. And we have an incredible staff, and I'm just one of them. And yep. I'm not, and I don't hold myself to be up any, any, anything else because well, all of these people that I work with, all of them, are totally incredible, and our boss is really <laughs> incredible. Great. I agree with you. Well, good. I want to transition, hard transition. We left the uh, convocation this morning with the students at the end, and you started to address, uh, at the end of your success, uh, the importance of giving <clears throat> back and the uh, years left. You put it, it was very touching uh, this morning when you said uh, the years left you got left, you want to head toward education, you have some initiatives, and if you could just briefly describe to the audience uh, how you got to that point, why is that the most important thing and use for your time? Well, and, thank uh, you for asking. Well, aside from work, <clears throat> you know, I had a, 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 and I don't want to go into detail with it, but I had a health scare, like many people do when they get to be my age, mm -hmm. and it was, and, and, I, and I had amazing health care through it, mm -hmm. okay? And so I think when I came off of that, um, one of the things that you start realizing is your mortality in a deeper sense, and yep. you're not going to be here forever, and what's going to be your legacy? What are you going to leave behind? What have mm -hmm. you done? And so one of the things that I really uh, started focusing on more, and it sort of just fell into my lap, mm -hmm. was working with young people in schools. There is a school in West Palm Beach, and I had known about it for a while, and mm -hmm. I've been over it for a while, called G-Star Studios. Mm -hmm. And this is just one of the most incredible schools on the planet. Mm. In fact, I remember I, I, you walk through the campus and high school kids, mm -hmm. they will come up to you and talk. They will come up to you and That's engage. Right. It is one of the most creative places. You see <clears throat> high school students working together to build incredible sets, to, do, to, to learn animation, from mm. ev everything involved in the visual and creative arts, they're doing it. Charter and school? Yes, charter. it is a charter school. Yeah. And one of the things that impressed me most is the founder of it, Greg Hopman, mentioned to me one of my, on my walkthrough, on one of the walkthroughs, he said, you know, we have autistic kids that come as part to this school, and the first day they're here, they leave the school with friends. We don't have bullying at the school. Yeah. We don't have fights at the school. Great. What we have are students who love being here right. and who embrace each other. We don't have the kind of cliques that yep. you have at most. Sides. And so this is a place I decided to invest some time in. And what they want to do is kind of replicate the model of what they're doing around the country. They're working now with a merged company called Charter School USA. Yep. And so I think, and, and I'm going to work with, with them in whatever capacity they want me with the, the limited time I have to, to make sure that the, what they're doing is vital. And then I was in Atlanta, uh, you know, for a, on a visit with a friend mm. who runs a software company, Software Anywhere. He's the CEO. And he was sponsoring a bike rally uh, with a group called the East Atlanta Kids Club. And I just fascinated by this story. Mm. Long story short, uh, they, a woman moves into a neighborhood right at the park, white woman. This is mostly a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Kids see, they engage her, 
and it's during the summer, and they eventually tell her how bored they are. She organizes a day with the kids so that they have total fun. They invite other kids. Mm, that's great. And at the end of the day, the kids say to her, wow, that was fun. What are we going to do tomorrow? Yep. <laughs> And tomorrow, I have to work tomorrow. She was a working journalist, as it turns out. Mm. Um, over the course of the next year or two, this grew into a club that helps over 180 kids, many of them underprivileged. Yep. Not all, but they are doing this on a shoestring budget. They are teaching kids up even robotics. They're right. doing uh, all sorts of work with in the IT sector, teaching mm -hmm. the kids and how to compete, how to be competitive, right. as well as working on their fundamental uh, academic skills. And they're also, it's a place where the kids can have fun. That's cool. And again, they're operating on a shoestring budget. I said to myself, you know, who, wherever I can take the message of what yeah. these people are doing and how they're doing it, yep. how wonderful. This is one woman. Right. This is one woman who started this yep. because she got engaged with people in her community. And now it's grown, but they still need some help. So you look at this, and I've been, I've been thinking about this while I'm here. We're here at, at, at Liberty University. This is not my first time at Liberty. I was here many moons ago when Reverend Jerry Falwell mm -hmm. was, was, still, uh, was still alive, and I had right. a, a, a fun meeting with him, a fine meeting with him. Mm -hmm. He was so warm. And he just exuded. It was not my first time meeting him. And every time I met mm. Reverend Falwell, what I got from him was just this beautiful aura of warm, mm. genuine yep. warmness. Now, you talk about somebody whose media caricature was so far removed from the man he yep. was. That was Reverend, Reverend Jerry Falwell. Yep. Um, he was just the warmest, nicest, most just effusive <laughs> individual. Right. So I was here, and so to come back to Liberty and now see the difference when I was here, what this is, this is totally yeah. amazing. Yep. And to see what Liberty is, has, has become and where it's going, yep. to kind of see the trajectory of this is just, is just stunning. But I bring that up to say one man, right? Yeah, one it's man, true. It's amazing. One man. Yeah. His idea. Yep. Look at Rush Limbaugh and what he's done. One man, yep. his idea. Look at the woman that I'm talking about, Jill, with the East Atlanta Kids Club. One woman, yep. her idea, her vision. We do live in a world where one person can have a tremendous impact, not only on their own life, but on the success and fortunes of others on the future of the country. Yep. And certainly when you talk about individuals like Rush, when you're talking about individuals that even <clears throat> like Jill, mm -hmm. you, from someone that has 30 million to someone that's reaching 180 people, yep. to somewhere where you have thousands and thousands of students. But this is where the change takes place. This is where the sustenance of America takes place. This is where America turns to people like these, these individuals who are so good and who have such a love for this country and such a love for their fellow citizens. This is what will propel this country and keep America strong, in spite of all the forces that are working to tear it down, both culturally and forces from outside to try to tear it down. Yeah, well, you're a, a great educator yourself, and the way you've just shared that is inspiring to the students out there. And this morning, you shared some of that with them, and they're, they're the hope for America. And so maybe let's just pivot to some lightning round questions kind of related to that. What your uh, just quick reactions to the, the growing rise of the popularity of socialism? Uh, China has been turning around, <clears throat> moving capitalists, opening up their markets, growing like crazy. Uh, following our cookbook that we used to use 50 years ago, and we're moving towards socialism. And uh, what, what's your initial reaction to this pivot of, you know, about half the American people are showing an interest? Well, we've been moving towards socialism for quite some time. Mm -hmm. It's not new. Uh, socialism doesn't work, and we've known that by experience. It's mm -hmm. just, at least for a society like this, we're not a homogeneous society. We're not 
We're a society of all kind of income strata, large population. Now, I'm sure you could look at some, some small countries around the face of the earth, mm -hmm. smaller countries that do not have the sort of uh, challenges that governing a, a nation like this has. Right. And you can say, okay, it's working. I mean, I, mean, I hear people talk. Yeah, but in not, terms of yeah. really a superpower that's, that's with socialism, it's not yep. going to work. It's a failed ideology, as is communism. Now, the issue, Dave, that I have is I'm a capitalist. Mm -hmm. But there are some things about capitalism that I think do need to be explored. Mm -hmm. How can you have... The economic, you said lightning rod, and here I am running my mouth like this. This <laughs> is good, not keep lightning. Keep going, keep going. Okay. Um, how can you have the economic downturn that you had in this country in 2008, where you had some people in financial houses who had basically scammed right. the world with yep. phony real estate deals? Yep. And not just scam their own countrymen, they scammed the world. Yep. They end up tremendously wealthy mm -hmm. and unaccountable. And then yep. tell some poor slob, Okay, you got busted with your stupid telephone scam. We're going to throw you in jail for right. a few years. That's amazing, right? Okay, so there are yep. those sort of uh, inequities that yep. I think need to be yep. addressed. Yep. Um, capitalist, a, a capitalist system is the best shot for humanity, for people that want to advance themselves out of poverty. Yep. We were talking, I think, last night about the state of sub Saharan Africa. Mm hmm. And so what's missing, why is sub-Saharan Africa still poverty-stricken, beyond belief, while other countries of the world are starting to develop more and more, including India, look at this, the paces that China's made, right. yep. look at what's going on even in, uh, in Southeast Asia, and yep. you see these advancing economies. Why? Yep. Because more of those economies are embracing capitalism. Right. And at the same time, sub-Saharan South Africa isn't. Right, right. And that's, uh, well, I want to work on that for the rest of my life. That's one of my passions, is helping the poorest of the poor get free markets and getting rid of dictators and that kind of thing. I want to go back to 08 with you in that financial crisis, because some people say, you know, that's capitalism. And if you look at that thing, the housing market led that whole disaster. And Fannie and Freddie May, right, the mortgage giants that are government-backed, Right, have monopoly power over mortgages. And so we're treating this like this is capitalism, right? Free markets. And don't forget that run on the Indy Bank that kind of right. started this yeah. thing that came from a United States senator's office forecasting that the bank was going to run. Right. Even though there was no real information that it was. Let's not forget that part. Yeah, of no, it. that's right. And all you look at the right now, <clears throat> you got the big information, right? You got Facebook and Google and all this stuff going on. Huge firms uh, that are fighting hard and going to D.C. and hiring lobbyists with millions of dollars so they get billions of dollars of benefit so the small guy can't enter and compete. And so one of my frustrations is we, do, we don't have free markets at all. We got big everything, big health insurance. We just, Obamacare is government run and the Democrats want to make it totally government run. Big automobile, big banking, a few banks, big uh, airline, big defense contractors. And so we're losing it. And uh, on both sides, and Rush, I think, is top at, at, at hitting this point. This crony capitalism has run on both right. sides. The government's been <clears> bought <throat> and paid for uh, by both sides. And uh, what your reaction, and how do the American people get a hold of their government well, again? What listen, do they got to do? Listen, now let me pivot it back to yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, let me pivot it back to you and let me pivot it back to liberty. Yeah. For one moment. Good. One of the geniuses of the American system here, one of our founding fathers, and I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't remember this, the quote verbatim, mm -hmm. but one of our founding fathers, I believe in the Federalist Papers, and I wish I could cite which one, mm -hmm. said that the, the integrity of this system depended on people remaining honest. Right, that's right. In order for this republic to work, right. we had to have honest yep. people and honest... Now, so how does that go back to liberty? Yeah. Look, every single one of these excesses on Wall Street, every single on, on Wall Street and in the financial institutions, all of them can be tied directly to one thing. Mm -hmm. People that are living dishonestly. Right. Whether it's expressed through greed, whether it's expressed through cheating, yep. whether it's expressed through lying, it still comes back 
to a moral center. Right. If you were handling your business honestly and doing what your role is honestly, as an industry, this wouldn't happen because right. people would be policing themselves. Right. And so when you have an entire system now that's greed run amok, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm not jumping down Elizabeth Warren's right. you know, bandwagon and saying, oh, we need to close down this, we need to shut down. I'm not right. coming from there at all. Yeah. What I am saying is that what we need to correct these problems yeah. is a return to a moral center. Right, I agree with you. Now, let's go, let's go further. Let's move away from Wall Street and move into the culture area. Mm -hmm. I watched recently a Democrat debate where once again the, the, the talk was all about guns and how they should come and take people's guns right, and, right. And, and this law and that law and this law and that law for guns. Beto. Right. When, when my grandfather was young and during his generation, during my father's generation, mm -hmm. Students in rural areas would often bring their guns to school and leave them in the locker. Right. Bring them into school, put right. them in their locker. Right. No one had any fear. Why didn't they have fear? Because morality yep. was present. Right. These are people who understood what thou shalt not kill means. Yep. Right. It means you don't go off half cocked because you're angry or you're bullied or whatever and shoot a bunch of your classmates. We keep looking for answers in law, right. and that changing the law is going to fix the problem. Changing the law is not going to fix the problem. People's hearts have to change, and the yep. only change you're going to have there is through a moral center. Right. Now, you can look at any other. Look at the health care. Health care. If health care administrators, mm -hmm. and if there was a sense of morality as the underpinning of health care, yep. a lot of the cost issues mm -hmm. would be brought under control. We can't honestly sit and say that it's the right thing to do to charge people, you know, $700 for an aspirin pill. Right. Okay? We can't say to someone who's sick, let everybody in the world come in, all, all the people on the staff, and get their beaks wet, mm -hmm. actually doing no service because we all want to drive up the insurance and all get paid for doing absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. A lot of the problems that consumers complain about in the healthcare system would be solved, not through a bunch of laws, but through morality. Now, I, right. I say every single aspect of American society, you can go through and put that to the test. Yep. And that's why Liberty University is so important. Well, I agree that's with you. Yep. why the approach to liberty is taking is so important. If you have God-centered people that are moral-centered and you're elevating those people into positions yep. of power and to take over positions of power in the future, that's where the change is going to come. I agree with you. What do you say to... Uh, kind of the empirical number. You look at Europe and the morality should be there. Well, it's not there. The churches are empty. <clears throat> uh, the cities are in disrepair. <clears throat> it's spreading here. And now the religious people have been taught uh, rightly uh, to be humble, to work hard, uh, not to get in people's face. But now the, they're in the minority and other people are discriminating against religious uh, people who just want to work and get about their lives independently. Uh, should religious people be ready for a fight coming up? How do you express this uh, publicly? Religious people are already in a fight. Yep. Not just in Europe, but especially here in the United States. Religious people are in a fight. Mm -hmm. You're in, there is spiritual warfare going on. Mm -hmm. Now, you, we can close our eyes to it or not. But it's happening. Yep. You know, there are those right now. There was a, a case, and I, I think I talked about this briefly today. Mm -hmm. There was a case in the UK where a doctor was removed from his job because he said two or three things. One thing was that he believed there were two genders. Mm -hmm. The other, that his Christian faith taught him that there were two genders. Right. And in the end, the tribunal ruled that him citing his Christian beliefs and yep. him citing <laughs> science, yep. biology, that there were two genders was uh, was an affront to human dignity. Yep. And he was fired from yeah. his job. Now, that's part of the warfare. Yep. People are being silenced. People are being taken out. 
of, of, of their jobs, for expressing their point of views. Look at what's happened in the United States to mm. bakers that didn't want to participate because of their religious beliefs mm -hmm. in, in, <clears throat> in same-sex marriages. Now, um, you know, and, I, and, and look, I'm not, I understand the other side of that equation. I have family members who are gay. Mm -hmm. I love them. Right. I want them right. to have great lives. Right. I don't want to see them harmed in any way. I don't want to see anybody harmed. Okay? But the issue is, to me, whether we are still going to be a nation that, that really does protect religious freedom mm -hmm. and religious independence. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that we should, at the same time, promote bigotry or intolerance. Not right. That's not... Right. What we're about is love. Yep. yep. Love. But, but, but with love and tolerance, there has to be love and tolerance for religious people, too. This right. nation was founded. Yep. Founded by people who came here in search of religious freedom. Yeah. Right. And that's something we should remember. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is amazing. Uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition founded Oxford and Cambridge over in England. Magna Carta was all... Christian over here, James Madison went to seminary, and uh, Harvard was founded by Christians, etc. And, and what's interesting is that used to be called liberalism, and I'm a liberal. If those are liberals, I'm a liberal, right? Harvard's liberal. JFK, uh, Catholic, uh, liked religion, uh, liked rule of law, liked the strong U.S. defense, etc. And then after the 60s, it's like the, the wheels came off. And now uh, the liberals are no longer liberals, right? They used to respect liberty, which is the root of liberalism, and now they've turned into the left, this leftist thing, and what I don't get is they don't seem to be offering any alternative. There's no alternative religion they'll mention. There's no alternative rule of law when they're, you know, mocking the police and the, the, the law officers who work every day hard. There's no alternative to being pro-business when business mm -hmm. pays for all of their nonprofits and all the, the, the good things that the left has stood for in the past. And so I, I just don't, what, what hurts me isn't the leftists or the media who's left or the elites that are left. What, what I don't comprehend in my head is how 50% of the American people are giving this a serious look when they're, they're, they're at war against the basic foundations that made this country great. All the empirical evidence, all the science, you, you can just study any of these things. All the science supports the kind of conservative vision of the success we've had. They don't have an alternative vision and yet somehow they're beating us. How in the world do they own the entire well, media? How are they beating us? Because they, they, they have emotion on their side and have mm -hmm. emotional arguments. But I want to go back to something you said, mm. because this is maybe, I don't know, this might strike you a little bit odd mm. coming from me. Mm -hmm. When you mentioned the police and institutions of police, this mm. is something I've been giving a lot of thought to. We had another, um, this will probably date this program a little bit, but this was fairly recent in the news. Mm -hmm. We had an incident in Fort Worth, Texas, where a woman playing video games with her, with her uh, nephew or, or, a, or young niece was murdered in her own house by a police officer who did, never announced he was a police officer, came through, saw a gun in the window, mm -hmm. and she had a gun because she heard rustling outside mm -hmm. of her window at mm -hmm. 2 in the morning right, and shot her dead. Mm -hmm. That was weeks after a, a woman, another police officer, was convicted of um, entering an apartment she said she thought was hers and killing the occupant there, black guy. Mm -hmm. And she was, she's now convicted, has to do 10 years. Right. Now, you can go on and on and on. I can cite to you cases where clearly the police officers were totally justified in taking the actions that they did mm -hmm. and deserve support and instead were hung out to dry. Yep. And those cases to me are sickening. Yep. But what is equally sickening mm -hmm. and what I do not hear my fellow conservatives talking about mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. are cases when agents of the state, and that is what police officers right. are, right. Yep. And we say that we want to be skeptical of government, but we right. don't want to be skeptical of government yeah. when agents of the state come in with the power to 
enforce capital punishment on citizens right. without a due, without the yeah. due process of trial yep. and without going through the process. And I will tell you, I find it very troubling. Mm -hmm. Again, I am not anti-police. No, I know. My right. next door right. neighbor was a police officer. Yep. Yep. I have friends that are police. The, our police officers deserve to be supported. Yep. But so do our citizens. No, that's absolutely right. When and right. and when these the, and and when when circumstances are warranted, when you have police officers that are in what I guess they call bad shoots, mm -hmm. we need to react to that too. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, there's something else in that too. You know, the relationship that a lot of black communities have. With their with police officers, it's just unhealthy. It's mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. And the question is never asked: Why is it in these blue cities? Why is it in New York, mm. Chicago, L.A., Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, Kansas City, Detroit, Philadelphia? Why is it that in all of these blue cities, the police officers in question? are in departments that are not being run by anybody but Democrats. Right, right. In other words, let me just put this more plainly. Liberals are in charge of all of these cities. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So where you have issues where there's quote unquote police oppression, mm -hmm. why are the liberals never called out for this? Yeah. Why does it become the fault? This is not the fault of America. We don't have to bend a knee against America. Right. What we need to be taking a knee for is taking a knee and find out what these liberals have done in these cities yeah. that the situations are the way they are. Yep. I think it's well put. Same thing with education. They're in charge of all the education institutions that are failing our kids. They're not being taught pro-business. Getting back to the, I like the, you just kind of talked about the size of the state. And it's amazing to me, the state is already huge. The left wants to make it huger. Warren, you brought up Elizabeth Warren. I think her policy prescriptions add up to $130 trillion, mm -hmm. in addition to what we're doing now, over, I don't know what, 10 <clears> or 20 <throat> years or something like that. Uh, but it's just amazing. We're having a brawl over stuff. Everybody wants free stuff. And so the left is proposing more free stuff. And the American people are saying, yeah, right now, in the short run, I want free stuff. And you said one of the reasons is that it's emotional. Uh, but why are the American people going along? It's just nonsense, right? Medicare's broken about eight years. Social Security's broken 10 or 15 years. Everybody knows the math. And so emotions involved. But uh, how are they carrying the day? And where are the Republicans fighting? Where have you seen the Republicans fighting and putting up a fight telling the American people this is, this is a fraud? And well, <clears throat> one of the things that I think as you put it, the American people see, and, and to answer your question, the American people see an entire class of people living the high life, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And they know, they know yep. that all these people didn't get that honestly. Right, right, right. They know yep. that the game is rigged, and again, here I am using some language of the left, and it just pains me <laughs> to hear myself say it, but, it's, but, it, but this part is yeah. true. No, it is true. They know that they can't go and do what these Wall Street tycoons do right. and know how to play the arbitrage and know yep. how to pay all these little... And they know that they're never going to get filthy rich mm -hmm. by understanding how to scam the system right. the way that an entire class of people yeah. has scammed the system. Yep. So now mm -hmm. you say to these same people, oh, you want to live large too? We can give you a program that you don't have to pay for. Right. You can right. live large. You can have your health care paid for. Yep. You can have, oh, what else do you want? You want some more loot during uh, your retirement? Yeah, we can raise you, give you some of this. Sure. Mm hmm You want another freebie over? Yeah. So as much as I find it distasteful, I right. understand why people, yeah. everybody wants to live the high life. Mm-hmm. And you can't blame people for wanting to get there without working because they see that that's been very successful, a very successful formula yep. for a lot of people that they deem successful. Now, that does not say that many people, I'm not a wealth, wealth, wealth basher. Most of the people I truly believe in this country who are wealthy earn their mm -hmm. wealth. And they earned it through hard work. They earned it through providing goods and services yep. to their fellow man. And I think the overwhelming large majority mm -hmm. of wealthy people in this country 
either they own the wealth or family on, on, at some point earned the wealth. Right. And it was done legitimately. Mm -hmm. So I'm not bashing wealthy people, but I think the images that we see are that a lot of wealthy people got their wealth through dishonest means. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that, but I think that that is the public perception. Yeah, well, it, it, it is interesting. You got populism on the left with Bernie and on the, on the supposed right or conservative side with Trump. Uh, and it's huge, and the left doesn't under, seem to understand it. They don't want to accept it. And there's some on the right, on the, on the conservative side, that are you know, anti-Trumpers or never-Trumpers. And they don't, they don't want to see that what you just said. The American people are seeing this, right? They've, they've been robbed. They know the thing is rigged. It's unjust. And the, this populist thing, how do you analyze? Is this a, a, a potential solution? Uh, the populist uprising, or is it going to, what, what, where is this uh, train going to end up? Well, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. But if you go back and you look at, uh, if you go back and look, I believe in the 1930s when FDR was still in office, and mm -hmm. I mean, what a crock that was in mm -hmm. certain ways, mm -hmm. domestically, great wartime president for the war, even though he got in late. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, mm -hmm. if you go back and look what he did in terms of the financial markets, mm -hmm. He brought in, I think it was Joe, Joseph Kennedy, the first SEC commissioner, someone mm -hmm. from Wall mm -hmm. Street, mm -hmm. who, who had the reputation for being one of the slick operators, yeah, right. but knew how to, to play the game. Right. And for a while, it was cleaned up. Yep. I think in order to fix a lot of what's in the financial markets now, we don't need a lot of more Dodd and Frank right, regulations. Right. We don't need of that. But what we do need are reforms coming from the people who actually know how to how the game is played mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. it got to where yep. it is. Yep. And I don't know whether anybody actually has a stomach to do that. Yeah. But I think a lot of t I think a lot of people are going to have distrust in this country overall until they honestly see that the rule of law is, is being followed. Mm -hmm. And that's just not in the economic markets. That means the border. Yep. That means that means in, in in so many other areas. You know, I, you look at the situation with immigration where people can just pretty much walk into your country. Right. And we know as Americans, anyone that has a passport and, and has gone to any other country, you know you're not going to do that in any other country right. in the yeah. world. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know you're not going to go in right. there and, and say, oh, I'm an American. Um, I want to, number one, stay in your country illegally. And mm -hmm. then what I'd like you to do mm -hmm. is pay right. for me to be here. I'd like benefits from your taxpayers. Yep. Oh, and if I have kids, I want to have my kids' benefits too. No, right. other nation, no other nation on the face of the planet is going to tolerate that. Right. Oh, right. No, 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 and no way. Right. Maybe some European countries yeah. will, but, uh, but most yeah, Mexico sane. Mexico do, right? <laughs> right. right? Mexico doesn't right. even do they that. Do. Right. right. <laughs> and, and if you and if you if they deport you in Mexico and you come back in, I believe at one time it was a 10 year. You were going to sit in one of those Mexican jails for 10 right, years. Right. You're not getting out easy. Yep. Yeah. So we live in a very strange time because then I see the institutions that are supposed to uphold the idea of law and respect for the law. Mm -hmm. I won't name the particular church. But mm -hmm. there's a church where you have some mm -hmm. very active leftists now that seem yeah. to have taken over no, the church. Amazing. And right. they're saying, not only are we going to promote this, but we'll yeah. give sanctuary right. to lawbreakers. Yep. Well, then how do you turn around and teach people right and wrong? Right. No, it's when amazing. you're clearly right. on the side of doing wrong when it, when, right. when it, when it meets your political convictions. Yep. So I, there are a lot of things I, I just don't yeah, know how they're going to be resolved. Going, that was one of President Trump's uh, strongest issues around immigration and, and uh, you know, all the billionaires and the cheap labor crowd has fought the White House. Uh, it's been a surprise to me to see how much they've fought even against the president. And uh, it just amazes me. I think you followed the, the President Trump. And I'm just curious your comments. You know, he's a New Yorker. He's tough. He's brash. Uh, but he loved everybody, as far as I see, his whole life. I mean, he's got a good family. He made friends, uh, African-American, sexual preference, all these guys. He didn't, I don't think he cared. Jewish friends of, of Israel, et cetera. He's friends with everybody. And all of that has been kind of swept away in this media frenzy that now he is being charged with, you know, all sorts of nasty, you know, crimes against humanity and all this kind of thing. And uh, how, 
How in the world can the press so, you know, you, you mentioned with uh, President Falwell here, senior, the press can just totally destroy these figures, and there's no one that comes behind to rebuild ever. And mm -hmm. it's just a war. What can we do on the media front <clears throat> to, to keep the American? I mean, it, that narrative has won over in terms of people's assessment of the president, et cetera. I lost race. I didn't think $13 million could, could do what it did. Uh, but it can. It, it can target a certain message and turn two plus two into five. And so how do we fight back on this? Well, can, well look, in certain regards, first of all, the, the racist narrative, which is the one that yeah. the left pulls out all yeah. the time, has gone largely unanswered mm -hmm. by those who've been branded racist, mm -hmm. at least by the professional political class. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm also very, very much engaged and involved in trying to slowly Good. but surely change that narrative, and the yeah. first thing you have to do, but but it's hard to change that mm -hmm. narrative when you're not a member of the community, right? You know. Right. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Queens, New York. AOC right now mm -hmm. represents the district that I grew up in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Queens and Bronx, right? Right. And when I was a kid, the Republican Party had an office on one of the main streets, mm -hmm. Farmers Boulevard. They had an, they had a uh, the Republican GOP office, right? Good. They were, they were part of the neighborhood. Yeah. Psst. Look for one now. Mm -hmm. Not there. Haven't been there. Yeah. I don't know whether they're there at the moment, mm -hmm. but but up until recently, when right. I went back and looked, you couldn't find them. Yep. Maybe they're back in Queens, in this particular neighborhood in mm -hmm. Queens right now. Now Queens is an interesting neighborhood too. It's one of the success stories in America. Black families mm -hmm. have the highest median income. Mm -hmm. Any other group? Hmm. Good. In Queens. Yep. Why? Hmm. Because we've had an influx. <clears throat> excuse me. Of people from the Caribbean who are Caribbean Americans, mm -hmm. who brought with them their work ethic, who brought with them their, their ethics for education, mm -hmm. which used to be the norm here. Yeah. And so what they've done is they've lifted up an entire major borough of mm -hmm. New York City, right? And they don't get cre a lot of credit for that. But <clears throat> one of the things that we have to do, conservatives, mm -hmm. Republicans, libertarians, you can't do this stuff from outside. Mm -hmm. You have to actually be part of the neighborhood you're trying to change. Yeah, that's good. You, you can't yep. do it with words. Yep. You have to do it with deeds. And you can't do it going in every four years and saying, oh, we're going to pay $10 million in outreach. Uh, like, outreach? Like, oh, let's go talk to the aliens? <laughs> outreach? They belong mm -hmm. to another planet? Let's reach over there and see mm -hmm. whether we... No. These are your neighbors. These are fellow American citizens. Right. If you're not a part of the, if you're not a part of the neighborhood, if you're not a part of the community, mm -hmm. if you don't engage people where they live and find out what it is they need in order to be successful, yep. what they need in order to arrive at their mm -hmm. full potential, then good luck asking people for their vote. And then they right. will believe anything negative about you because you're not there yeah. with right. good deeds to defend yourself. Yep. Yep. I. I in my dreams, I dream the church would fulfill some of that function. That churches are all around, it's just a built-in labor market. You got successful people, you need people that need help, and within the church, I've always, it's like, what, what's going wrong? Why isn't that working anymore? And so uh, I, I know you're working uh, politically to, to make that happen. And how, how are you, what's your model? How do, how do we go into every neighborhood across the country? We're still looking at that, we have to start. What is the model? I, I, I honestly, and I'm, I'm just at the beginning of that part mm -hmm. of my, my, mm -hmm. my projects, too. So I, I think one of the things you have to do is go in listening. You can't go in, and we hear this all the time, yeah, I'm only listening to her, I'm right, only listening. Right. No, but yep. you, if you, you have to understand what people need, not from your point of view, mm -hmm. but from their point mm -hmm. of view. It's one thing for us to say the scale, the schools are failing, mm -hmm. and we're looking on the outside, we look at the scores, we look at all this, we look at the bad behavior in some schools, mm -hmm. we look at the things that are, that are, I mean, I've been in schools, not just in New York, I've been in schools in Florida that are shocking. Mm -hmm. The horrible behavior. I was in a school uh, not too far away from the Parkland School District, except this school a lot of minorities in this school, right? Mm -hmm. One of the students, I was talking to the student body, this kid was on a cell phone, I remarked about it. The kid got agitated. 
right? Mm -hmm. The teacher comes over and tries to defuse the situation, and this student, black guy, stands up and just starts cursing her out in front of the whole student body. Mm -hmm. F you this, F you that, and basically looking about it's going to threaten. They had to bring two or three people in. Mm -hmm. Now, in certain schools, that would never happen. Why is it permitted in, in black schools? Mm -hmm. Why do we permit kids to elevate all the way mm -hmm. through grades K and becoming high school with the kind of behavior problems that, we, that are sometimes prevalent mm -hmm. in schools where you have large minority populations? Now, of course, not all of them are like that, and I'm not trying to mm -hmm. just paint everyone with a bad, broad brush, but in New York, they're over, New York City alone, there are over 240 <coughs> Eight, I think I read, or, or close to that number, failing schools. Schools that the city knows are failing. Yeah. And I guarantee you that there are behavior problems in many, that sh in many of those schools that should not be tolerated. Yep. And so yep. what's the answer? What are they doing in New York? What they're proposing to do in New York is to strip the high achieving schools of their special status. Hmm. They want to mix those students mm -hmm. in with everyone else mm -hmm. so that they, they think that will, will solve the problem somehow right. by making things equal. Right. And all it's going to do is discourage the high achievers. Yep. They're not going to fix the problem. It's, 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 it's absurd. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I just, I, those stories, I read Hillbilly Elegy and some of these these books that are the same thing. And a lot of it just has to do with white, black, Hispanic, whatever community, but the, just kind of the, if you watch any of the, just the pop TV shows, the, it's just in season to make fun of the dad, mm -hmm. right? The dad's just the pit of all jokes, just dad's silly, why would you listen to your dad? Why would the dad discipline? And uh, it, it is just shocking that the family is in disrepair across the board, across the, the culture, and the kids are growing up uh, without both parents intact, and the stats are just overwhelmingly, you know, <clears throat> I was on Fox News uh, inadvertently because they picked up of a story from an interview that I did a few years back. This happened maybe two or three years ago. And I mentioned in the interview mm. that, um, that I was doing that uh, black families now, certain black families, and certain black people look back on the 1950s as the quote unquote good old days hmm. because, because most, the majority of black families were two parent families. Mm -hmm. Because even though the schools were still segregated, you had more black people that were actually understood the value of education, the rate of homicides were nowhere near what they are today, where the, the number one threat to um, the life of young black men or other black men, that is the highest homicide rate. More, yeah. more black men 18 to 24 will be killed by other black men than any other cause. And the mm. numbers on it are actually staggering. Mm. Um, and in the 1950s, in, in Jim Crow era, as horrible as Jim Crow was, mm -hmm. and no one ever said it wasn't, mm -hmm. the black Americans had the lowest rate of abortion hmm. of any ethnic group in the country, hmm. right? Now, black people have the highest rate of abortions. Black people, two-parent families, shattered, thanks to the Great Society mm -hmm. programs. Mm -hmm. You look at what has happened in black education, it's pitiful, and we all know it's pitiful. You look what goes on in certain aspects of black culture, and we could talk about that for days, mm -hmm. but no, it's, it's impolitic to talk about that. It's impolitic to talk about how gangster rap is actually fueling, mm -hmm. not just misogyny, mm -hmm. but fueling these, these crazy homicide rates that we've seen among other blacks. Um, and by the way, I'm not coming at this as some kind of saint. As I said um, when I was speaking earlier, you know, I took a walk on the wild side in my yep. life. Yep. Okay? And, 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 and I can't sit here and speak from some on high position of being Mr. Righteous. Mm -hmm. So I get it. I get that. But I will say that at the end of the day, 
when you have to crawl on your knees and beg for forgiveness, it's, if, if you do have a conscience and look at things you've done in your life that are wrong, yep. it's not very pleasant. Right. And, and that's very real too. But anyway, you look back at all what has happened to black culture and how it's being destroyed in this country. And you look at all that stuff. And again, there's only one solution. The solution is not going to come from laws. The solution is not even going to come from a political party. Mm -hmm. There has to be a moral yep. uplift yep. in order to correct some of these massive problems. Yep. All around. I think I'm going to agree with you on that one and call it a wrap. Okay. And I want to thank James Golden for being with us at Liberty University today. It's been a great, I had dinner with you last night and I've followed you from time to time. We used to have chats a little bit over politics and uh, got you to Liberty and I'm so glad you came. The students gave you rave reviews this morning. The faculty said you did an outstanding job. And uh, I just consider you a personal friend and a well, friend Dave, of Liberty. Well, you're, you're a great friend, and thank you for having me here. It's just, it's wonderful to be back at Liberty after all these years. Great. Um, and it's wonderful to see where Liberty uh, is, has come and where it's going. And I will say again, I truly believe that the students here at Liberty University mm -hmm. represent what is so hopeful yep. for America. And the same for their faculty, including you. Yeah, well, thank you. You got a powerful voice, and we're glad to have it here, and we're glad to have your support in Liberty. So God bless you. Thank, thank you. you, James. Thank All right. you. Thank you. All right.